Imagine this, you're standing at the edge of doing something big. You've dreamed of it for years, being your own boss, building an empire from the ground up, but there's a problem. Every great journey has its obstacles, and this one is no different. For every entrepreneur, there are these crucial moments, decisions that can either propel you forward or hold you back. The question is, which way will you go? Most new business owners fall into some of the same traps over and over again. But what if I told you right now you can avoid some of them? What if the difference between struggling and success was just a few small adjustments? In this episode, we're breaking it down. The missteps, the pitfalls, the mistakes, ones that have cost others everything. And most importantly, we show you exactly how to steer clear of them. Because when you know where the traps are, you can walk right past them and into your own success journey. Are you ready to make your next move your best move? Well, let's go. Let's get started in three, two, one. Let's go. Let's get this money. Bills, get it, let's get this money. One What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And I love this episode. I often get asked these questions in masterminds and groups, cigars, meetings, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the missteps and mistakes that early entrepreneurs make? So we took some time to jot these down. Let's get started. Number one, focusing too much on your product, focusing too much on your widget, focusing too much on your offering and your service. Now, that being said, you got to have a great product. You got to have a great offering and you got to have a great service. But most entrepreneurs, because they potentially may come from some form of excitement in their product, excitement of their widget, excitement in their offering service, they focus solely in on that and overthinking that and over perfecting it, but never bringing it to the marketplace. They let procrastination into innovation and recreation, research and development overwhelm them into saying, listen, let's just get, if it's 80% good, let's just get it out there. And the remaining 20%, guess what you gotta do? You gotta perfect the remainder the 20%, you gotta improve the 80% of that 20%, and by the time you have the second iteration of your product, your service, your offering, you're 94, 95% there. Don't focus so much on that product or service. I mean, think about this. The original iPhone, let's even go back. Think about the iPod. You remember the iPod? And guess what? The iPod is no longer around. It's inside your iPhone as an app. But they focus more on the experience. They didn't focus on it being an MP3 player. You know, I remember reading Simon Sinek's book, starting with why. He talked about Dell computers and Apple. Dell computers started selling this MP3 player with 35,000 songs on it, but he sold it purely under the vision of this storing 35,000 songs and it being called the MP3 player. Would you like to buy it? Nobody says, no, I don't even know 35,000 songs, let alone I'm fine with my CD player, my compact disc player that I go jogging with. But they sold it just as this MP3 player, which is cool, which is fine, but it was just more from a widget standpoint. But what did Apple do? They sold the iPhone like a lifestyle. That you're cool by wearing this iPod, these white headphones, this white device, and colors and branding and dance and excitement and enthusiasm was filling the brand. That's the way they sold it. And by the way, they didn't even call it an MP3 player. They called it an iPod. And it started the i revolution. iPhone, i this, i that. So they focused on the experience the coolness factor, the brand of it, what did Dell computers focus on? The widget, the product, the service. Now I'll say this too as well. When you talk about products and services and offerings, you invoke this unique thing called capitalism. Capitalism means that every step of the way, year in, year out, you have got to improve. So you got to improve more than just the product. You got to improve more than just the customer experience. You got to improve more than just your offering. Everything about you has got to improve but when you don't sell anything, you have no money to improve. You have no money to hire and create more staff and scale. So here are three areas that you can avoid this mistakes. Number one, you gotta focus on selling your product, your service, your offering. And the second point is you gotta recruit a team to sell it to as well. You just can't be the only salesperson of your organization. And number three, you gotta to continue to upgrade your talent and establish relationships to get people to know more about your product, your service, and your offerings. I'm reminded of a company within inside my space, the insurance space, the financial services space. I have got respect, I'm not gonna mention their name, but I'm pretty sure many of you are watching this video who follow my content, who's also in the insurance and financial services space, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But they just sell one product, that's it. Not only do they sell one product, they only sell their own company's product. They don't even sell their product and the other competitors in their industry to offer the clients the best customer price. No, they just offer one product through their company. And the product is an offer 
modern strategies like living benefits, meaning that, for example, life insurance today, if you suffered a heart attack, stroke, cancer, you need assistance as you get older with long-term care. Living benefits and policies today have a, have a rider on typical, your typical life insurance policies. And if you survive that heart attack, stroke, or cancer, you get money actually from your life insurance policy while you're alive. In my book, Gotcha, I wrote about Dustin Frampton. He's the one who built my website, MoneySmartGuy.com. He became a customer. And sadly, in 18 months after purchasing a policy from our firm, he had a stroke. But thank God that policy had living benefits, which this company that I'm mentioning does not. You have to be terminally ill in order to get money from that policy. It means you've got to be buried 12 months from buried in the ground. This policy has living benefits, meaning that you can have a long life ahead after you survive a heart attack, stroke, and cancer, and you're free to spend that money however you want to spend it without paying a dime in tax. Once again, called a living benefit. That's exactly what I receive from one of the insurance companies you do business with. Why? Because we offer multiple carriers for our customers out there that have different needs, that have different timelines in their life, that have different financial strategies that need to plan for and do risk management with life insurance policies. And guess what? He receives a multiple six-figure income check. He's still able to raise his four kids. They weren't moving from the house. They expanded their business. They're gainfully employed as his graphic design company as him and his wife are living their life. They're doing their thing without disrupting their life due to them having the right policy with living benefits. So the reason I bring this up because this company painted themselves in a corner that they're gonna only offer this one financial strategy for the rest of their life. And this is going back to the 1960s. And that's saying, hey, I don't believe in your capitalism that you have to improve and grow. You don't think the insurance industry has offered more products and services in the 1960s and 1970s? Of course it has. Yet the company today, thank God, is still in business, still a multi-billion dollar company. But sadly, there's so much more competition rising up in the insurance space that these guys are getting battered by the competition. And this company can't afford to expand their offerings because they built their business and their reputation on a financial philosophy that if they go back on the financial philosophy and expand their products and services, that goes back and say, well, we never believed in that financial philosophy and product philosophy to begin with. And so therefore they're stuck in a corner. And yet the competitors are swallowing up market share, which by the way, that tells you there's so much market share in the financial services space anyway, they'll do fine, but they won't be the number one company in the marketplace very, very much longer. You know why? Because we're in business. <laughs> And I'll tell you this, the company that we're building today, we built and we had an exit in 2022 of nearly $300 million. CEO, founder, Patrick and David, and us building this company together. And I'll tell you this, we're building the next multi-billion, next 25, 50, 100 plus billion dollar company because we have the right partnerships, we got the right innovation, we got the right leaders at the top, expanding vision, and not solely focusing on just product. They're focusing on the whole package and innovating and growing, but of course, you still have to have a great progress service to offer. But it's not the only thing to worry about. Number two, underpricing your product and service. When you do that, that's a straight race to the bottom. This company here says, I can do better than this. They underprice your product to get the business. This company said, this not happen to us again, so they underprice their product. Well, this product says, hey, I just lost a, a bid to that company. We're gonna underprice our product. Boom, 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 it continues to happen. And guess what? The margins, 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 margins are squeezed and squeezing to there's no profit. One of them can't afford to stay in business. And it's not, by the way, it's not good. It's not good. Listen, I'm counterpointing here. It's not good when you don't have competition. For me, competition makes me stand on my toes. It makes me want to create and not last and not work and not strategize and not innovate my competition. That's what makes it better for the customer is good competition. By the way, I say that right now in a world where we only have iPhone and Androids. That's not good. But nonetheless, when you're looking at underpricing products and services, there's three areas here that you can improve in this, in this category. Number one, you have to have three different pricing strategies to offer to your customers. And on top of that, you have to have a middle product or a flagship product that you know your target market, the niche that you're in, everybody's gonna buy that no matter what. You're gonna have a step-down product to really strip down your flagship product. And at the same time, you can have an upgrade product that everybody wants to bells and whistles because they're experiencing, they're loving, they're experiencing working together with you. They want the whole, they want the whole kitchen sink thrown into the experience and they're gonna be willing to buy everything from you because they love their relationship and ongoing engagement with you. So you have to have a premium product, a flagship product, and a stripped down product to offer to your customers and allow the customer to decide where they want to spend their money. And the last thing I'll say about this category, you've got to protect your margins. Because if you don't protect your margins, 
you're going to squeeze down on your profitability. You're going to squeeze down your capitalization. And the next thing you'll be in a position where you need to attract investor money that can want a piece of your company, or you're going to attract business loans and come to your company. And they're going to have to pay them interest. If you have enough margin in your product and you're standing firm on your product or service and you have the ability not only to say yes to a customer, but at the same time you have the ability to say no if it's not right for you because you're protecting your margins. Because if you keep squeezing down your margins because of competition doing so, eventually you, my friend, will be out of business. Number three, not delegating tasks early enough. Well, Matt, you don't understand. I can do it faster. In fact, I can not only do it faster, but I can do it cheaper. I remember one story here of a friend of mine who was my partner at one point, and uh, we were building our Chicago office, and he was coming from the military, and he comes from Chicago, so humble beginnings, came into business with me, and for one week, it's like, bro, where are you? Where'd you go, man? We got a business to build. Where'd you escape to? He says, man, I've been in my house, taking apart my dashboard, because I need to fix something in my car that's inside my engine. is not working right now. I'm on YouTube right now trying to figure out in my truck how to take out the dashboard to get to this area of the engine compartment so I can fix this. I said, bro, time out, man, time out. You're licensed now, bro. You're my partner. You're basically trying to do in one week what a professionally trained mechanic will do in three to four hours for 500 bucks. What's your time worth? You need to delegate that to somebody else. You need to delegate to somebody else that is specifically trained in that endeavor and you need to stay focused and keep on the main thing. And I don't know, maybe it was a knee-jerk reaction from this person. Maybe they didn't want to go out and do the work. Maybe they want to grow and innovate. Maybe they just want to hide behind something they, they can control, which is working on their truck. Well, whatever it was, the business wasn't growing. Or he wasn't getting any new customers. And more importantly, he wasn't putting more money in his pocket, which effectively, the company wasn't putting any more money in their pocket. So I asked him a question. What would your time be if you spent the last three to five hours for a mechanic to do it? You spent 500 bucks for them to do it. But in turn, you make $3,000 with those same three, four hours, five hours because you set up appointments, you got the right handshakes, you got the right introduction, you got the right referrals in those three, four, five hours that you can be very productive growing your business versus trying to do it cheaper and faster yourself, watching a YouTube video doing it, and hopefully even get the job done right. And you don't even know that either because it's your first time doing this. So your job as a leader of your company is to find out where your power spot is. Find out what your unique skill set is. Find out what your unique ability is. And then evaluate what other people on your team's unique ability is. And guess what your job now is to make sure that you assign tasks and roles and responsibilities to everybody's unique ability. Then you create what we call a unique ability team. Meaning that everybody comes to work now, they're fired up and excited. Why? Because they're operating and working in their unique ability. And they're not working on tasks and responsibilities that don't give them energy. Think about this. What do you focus in on? What are you excited about when you go to your office? Boom. I'm excited about doing this. I'm excited about doing it. Awesome. Everything else you need to create a job for because it robs you of your passion. It robs you of your energy. It robs you of your enthusiasm. But yet, the irony is it gives somebody else excitement, passion, enthusiasm. That person you need to hire to create and do those jobs. So instead of worrying about you trying to save a buck, you need to focus on creating revenue so therefore you can create jobs. Number four. Lack of cash flow management. Listen, if there's a lifeblood into your business, it sure, for sure is gonna be cash. You need money to do what you want to do. Your business needs money for you to expand and grow. You have a stewardship responsibility to handle your investors' money, the people that believed in you using their money. You have a stewardship responsibility with the money pretend you may have borrowed from your credit card or business line of credit. You have a responsibility that you owe other people if you took money from them to make the most out of your business. And what stings a lot of business owners is their lack of cash flow management. I reminded of a business plan competition that I was a judge at in Chicago. And on behalf of Miller Coors, we're, we're awarding $250,000 to fund and finance a minority owned business. And when the question we asked one of the entrepreneurs who's raising capital for his company, because he's got his business set up in a, in a university, he's doing his research and development at a university's facility, which is fine. And one of the questions we asked him, okay, if we give you this money, if we give you 50 grand, we give you 100 grand, we give you $250,000, what would you do with that money? Where would you spend it? Who's your first phone call? And we found out right away that the financing, the funding of our seed capital, if he was going to award, if he was going to be awarded the money, would be funding his lifestyle, would be funding his apartment, would be funding his car payment, would be funding his bills. It wasn't financing what? The business. So his lack of understanding what an entrepreneur does, he didn't get funding from us. And guess what? Because he didn't manage his finances properly and show us that he was going to be a wise steward of our capital, we didn't give him money. 
Why? Because he can learn, number one, how to make his product serviceable and saleable and scalable. And number two, for the margins he would earn, he didn't know how to bring that money back into the company to capitalize the company, reinvest that money back into the company to improve his product and service, simultaneously selling more of his current product and services before 2.0 version of his product comes out. It was him and his lifestyle they were funding. Zero chance for you getting our investors' money. So bottom line, many entrepreneurs live on their business too soon. For three years, I used to wear on this wrist a bracelet from Damon John when he interviewed Damon John, who wrote the book, The Power of Broke, one of the sharks on Shark Tank. He wrote the book, Power of Broke. And for three years, I let my wife manage the finances. I let my talents and skills and abilities go out there, market, brand, and attract money, attract business, grow and scale it with new talent and new personnel to grow our company. Because between my wife and I, as my partner, guess what she was enthusiastic about? Guess what her unique ability was? She just got the degree in finance. I don't. She was the one, she was the one who went to Pittsburgh to get a degree in finance. Not me. She's a smarter one. She got the D1 scholarship athlete to play softball. Not me. I'm just a jarhead out there willing to kick down the wall and make things happen, baby. But between my wife and I, she was the better partner when it came to managing, managing cash flow. And we do our we would do our reviews, make sure all the bills were paid, and we're not behind on anything. And so make a long story short. The, as long as we've been in business together, uh, which is about going on 10 years now, we've never been late on rent, we've never been late on our bills, we've been ahead actually. And when it comes time for us to negotiate office space and we show them our previous tenants' letters, we show them that we've never missed rent, guess what? These landlords love to rent us space. Above and beyond our credit score, above and beyond our financials, they know our history, they know our reputation of renting office space and paying bills and never having any collections or any bad credit scores on our end, guess what? We are deemed a better candidate for the cash versus another candidate who may not be managing the cash flow and finances that well. The other area of cash flow management is your ability to reinvest back into the business. You need to feed the machine versus you buying the car, buying the gear, going on vacation, living the life just to satisfy Instagram likes and follows instead of capitalizing your business. I'm reminded of an interview we did when we visited with Kevin Hart in Chicago. And uh, we had a conversation when Patrick Dave was doing the interview, and uh, minus the poker game that we had uh, later on, but we had a funny conversation about finances. Let's take a look at what Kevin Hart said about his lack of mismanagement of his finances, what type of trouble he got in, and the irony being that now he's the financial advocate, a financial literacy advocate for Chase Bank. Let's take a look at what happened to him in 2009. I, I was like, what, I don't understand what happened to the money that I had. I looked up, I couldn't even tell you where it went. Where, where is it? I just remember seeing a bunch of jerseys That's nine and nine years ago. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I remember saying, I said, man, if you give me a second chance, give me a second chance. You gotta think, this was the movies. I had, uh, I did Soul Plane at the time. I had some TV shows. I had like my Scary Movie threes, fours. I had all of this stuff. But I didn't pay tax. Nobody told me. I didn't You've understand. You've already done all these things, and you. Nobody told. I knew nothing, so I ended up owing like five hundred thousand. It was like a weird number. And Very I was like, weird. Yeah. I said, "Give me a second shot." I said, "It'll never happen again." I remember. I said, "It'll never happen again." I learned my lesson. I just got to figure out how to recover, and that's when I went back to the heavy stand-up grind, had some popularity. I was. I had a little bit of recognition with my face. People would go, "Oh, that's the guy." So I started doing comedy clubs. I started selling out comedy clubs. And I, the business manager I had at the time, I fired. I wanted to understand how to control my money, deal with my money, make sure I see my checks, sign all my checks. And I said, I want to take the absolute minimum amount for myself and everything else, I'm just going to put in an account. I'm going to call it a tax account. And until I get that number back, plus a percentage on top of it, I'm going to live off of that minimum amount. You made that decision at that time. I, That's I had no what choice, yes. And then once I, did, I got out the hole in like a year and a half, Yeah. I got out the hole from all the comedy clubs, and then I said, Took I'm going to you and a half to pay off the 500000 Yeah, because I was doing comedy clubs. So I was making fifteen grand, eight grand, ten grand, nine grand. I was doing well You got to make a million club. to pay half a million, because well, you know, everything the is... The next year, I dedicated the same thing so I could get out that hole even more. Yep. So I paid that back and then the following year, I did the same thing so I could be double out the hole. So I'm in a hole, 500, but you really do need Another, a million. Yes, you need that. Yeah. But because the government, it was so long, I was able to get a little bit of a break in the amount of money I owed. 
So I settled for a less amount. It was still a chunky amount, but I, I ended up paying probably like 700 total to get out. But it took me a year and a half, two years to wow. do that. And then once I got out, I said, oh, never again. How are you handling it at that time while you're performing? Like, are you, because this is pressure. This is a pressure type situation. Well, now, so you've when, seen the worst. It's no pressure. You've seen the worst. But when you're performing, you're not even thinking about no, it. You're performing. I've, you're just, I have a game plan. I'm going to go hit it. I'm going to make that money back. And I've seen the worst. Got it. What else can happen? Just I, I nine just, years ago. Yes. Bro. I faced the worst. I saw it. Oh, that's what it looked like. There it is. That's what, that's what don't have nothing look like right there. <laughs> oh, I don't want to see that shit again. So, so let, let me, let me, let me. <laughs> That's so, the difference. So when, when was it when you made real money? When is like, when I'm talking real money, because there's a big difference between 225 and 5 million. Now. I've been making real money for a while Well, you, you, you've been making real money for yeah, a while now. For a okay. while now. It's, it's all over. I do so much. So I'm able to see it from so many different streams. But there's no monster like the monster of touring. No monster. You know, oh, I, I own my tour. It's all me. Live Nation is my partner, but you know the deals are all to me. I keep my partner in the loop Mayweather because I'm loyal styles. to them. So this is got interesting. It. I keep it. I keep them in the loop because I'm loyal to them because they were there with me in the beginning. Got it. So I'm never going to cut them out. Let, let me let me talk to you on the comedian side a little. Wow, that was a, that was a profound statement right there. I'm loyal to them because they're with me since the beginning. And my success right now, I will not cut them out because he honors his beginnings. He, I can't talk. By the way, if you got sales rep that's been working together with you for years and they cut you out because they think they find a different deal somewhere else and they're going to make more money over there, they're missing this intrinsic component about their value system. And it's okay, just let them go. Because those guys will probably most likely never do anything big for a sustainable period of time. They might have a great one year, a great five shoot, they might have a great 10 years. But for a sustainable period of time, they'll never have it because people just like them, they'll attract. Guess what eventually is going to happen to them? Stuff catches up and they leave and they smash and grab because they forget, these folks forget who was there from them when they had nothing. What a very profound thing. I thought I was going to react to him, $500,000 in debt with the IRS. I love that last portion, what he just said about his relationship with the Live Nation. Okay, so my observation is my reaction to what Kevin Hart just said and hopefully what you're taking away from this too as well is that Kevin Hart, look, he went back to his core product. What was his core product? With number one philosophy we're just talking about here the number one strategy here is focus on a great not only product or service but the distribution of it and getting it out there because when push come to shove with kevin hart when he's his back was against the, against the wall 500k in debt with the irs and you know if you ever get in debt with the irs and you don't pay them back they shut everything down they shut down your bank accounts they try to seize stuff from you they'll find you man they'll shut you down especially at this level they might even throw you in jail so for him as patrick had mentioned all that pressure he just went back into the zone he went back to how he originally made money, which is his natural talent, skill, and ability, his unique ability in town that he cannot delegate. That's why he fired his business manager. Well, Kevin Hart, my observation here is the, the uniqueness and brilliance of him is he went back to the repetition and the work ethic. And by the way, you heard it. He wasn't making like $100,000 per gig. He was making, he said, $9,000 a year, $15,000 a year, $8,000 a year, $20,000 a year. And the monster, his core product was his ability to tour. To go out there and create a national buzz and audience. And by the way, the byproduct of him not only creating a national tour, that funded and financed his other business endeavors. So he would not have those other streams headed up at him having a great product, which is his ability to be a comedian. And once he managed his finances, guess what? Recently, a couple of years ago, a company comes in, gives him $100 million to grow his company. He remains the chairman of that company. So this is our hedge funds now starting to get into the streaming world. And one of the leaders of the streaming world was Kevin Hart. He got $100 million. I think his valuation of his company, about $650, $150 million. They dropped this money in and I think it's only, he only gave a 15% of his company. So the value of his company had a very hefty upside for this company he managed. And you're not gonna get a $100 million investment if you don't learn how to manage your finances. So not only do you have a great product and service offering, distribution, relationships, bingo, now he's got investors. And that's what you want, to go from a little company to a big company. Which leads me to my last point. Don't overcomplicate your business model. Early on in our work together with Patrick but Dave in 2016, in our weekly mastermind and dream team calls, he'd said, Sapal Az, you've broken a lot of records with inside the company. You've broken this, you've broken that, your first two, your first two here, first two, which is basically our first two accomplish certain things at a company level. We have a nickname at PHP called First Two. And when Patrick said this statement, he said, Sapala's keep doing the same thing, just 
don't get bored. Huh? I wrote that down in my notes. And by the way, I got, I got eight years of weekly meetings with PBD. Eventually create a book out of it one day. Don't get bored. What? And so I wrote that down and I just kept building a business. We kept building, we kept expanding, we kept scaling, kept growing, kept refining our talent, refining the way we ran our systems. We just got better. We got richer. We expanded. We started building wealth. We started helping create others build wealth. I asked him three years later, PBD, what did you mean back in 2016 when you said don't get bored? Because ain't nothing boring about what we're doing. What do you mean don't get bored? He goes, so Paula, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. See, most guys try to overcomplicate the business model because they got away from the fundamentals. So we never got away from the fundamentals. If my fundamental is to do one, two, three, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, that's going to make me 100,000. That's going to make me 250,000. Guess what? I should never depart from doing that. And guess what a lot of CEOs, guess a lot of guys do? They get away from that model of A, B, C, one, two, three. They get away from blocking, tallying, shooting, and passing. They get away from the fundamentals of the X's and O's of their business. And a lot of them think that by growing and innovating and overcomplicating things, that they're more important to do those other things. Nah, bro. Your first thing you got to do, you got to do the fundamentals of the business that makes your company profitable. And when you're a profitable company, all you got to do now is scale that. Don't overcomplicate that. In fact, scale it by creating this SOP, the standard operating procedures that allows you to delegate roles and responsibilities to duplicate yourself into multiple people locally, regionally, and nationally. In fact, if you come across our offices, any one of them, whether you're in Chicago, you're in Dallas, you're in Atlanta, you're in Memphis, you're in Orlando, you know, Washington DC office in the DMV or Orlando office, you're in my Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood office, it's the same model. And guess what I don't worry about on Tuesdays when, it, when all of us are running our weekly workshops. You know what I worry about? I don't worry about what these guys are doing. You know why? Because we're simple. And so one of the biggest attractions why Oscar De La Hoya invested $10 million into a company in 2017 and why we had a $300 million, nearly a $300 million exit here in July of 2022. And since then, we've nearly doubled the company post-acquisition on our way to become a billion-dollar company. And guess what we're not doing? Overcomplicating the business model. It's still doing the same thing over and over and over again. Now just wider and broader and deeper and more established, not necessarily routine, but systematic. Many people add to their situations more problems in order for them to feel important. Don't make that mistake. Someone once told me, you make millions and billions with the boring and the mundane. But yet the fundamental, the mundane, the boring, if it's systematic and profitable, it'll lead you to a different level of the promised land that you've never experienced before. For example, Amazon. Remember Amazon? Well, they started in 1994. And guess what they focus solely in on? For four years straight, they focus on selling books online. Taking over, where they even got a lawsuit from Barnes & Noble saying, we're the largest, world's biggest bookseller. Barnes & Noble said, no, you're not. You're just a book broker. <laughs> and they went back and forth, back and forth. Barnes & Noble was very competitive. And guess what? Who's the biggest bookseller now? It's not Barnes & Noble. It's not Borders. Remember them? It's Amazon. But for four years, they focused on one product to sell online delivery to the customer. It was only until they went public and after IPO and they acquired an online catalog and acquired other things. Now they're offering more things to more people through a model that they've established for four years. Now they start offering more things because now they got more customers they established over a four or five year period. In fact, they told investors, don't expect a profit from Amazon for 45 years. So they manage expectations up front. And today, what happens if you invested in Amazon back in the 1990s? Where would your portfolio be today? I mean, look at my Starbucks cup. I'm drinking right now Starbucks. And guess what's in the front? We went to the original Pike Place location in Seattle where the original Starbucks store is located. And we got this coffee cup. And by the way, Starbucks, when were they created? 1971? 1971, how much has this logo changed? Howard Schultz buys this uh, company in 1987. How much did he change the Starbucks logo? But what changed? Sales, distribution, and today, there's over 38,000 Starbucks across the world, of which Starbucks, there's over 16,000 only in the USA. There's more Starbucks across the world, scattered all over the globe than it is in America. But guess what didn't change much? The logo. So they focused in on not just the fundamentals, the mundane, they focused on distribution because they had the fundamentals down packed. So what company you want to be? You want to be in an overly specialized company but you're not scaling, you're not growing, you're too narrow, you don't have much latitude, you don't have much bandwidth, 
or you want to scale and create distribution, at this point, you should have an idea of what you're looking to accomplish. If you're not clear about what you're looking to accomplish, there's companies like us that can help you blast through those barriers. And who knows, maybe a conversation with us, have a conversation with, on Manek with us, reach out to me. On Manek, we'll put our link right here. You'll have a question, 25 bucks, you get an answer. Or if you want to set up a video conference, 15 minutes, you can do that too as well. There's many different ways for you and I to connect online, so therefore there's valuable exchange for you. It's meaningful time for me spent with you to get you to the next level. Let's get you there to avoid these mistakes that new entrepreneurs make, so therefore you can get ahead in your business plan much sooner and faster, especially closing off the rest of the year and getting a head start in the year. That being said, what is your biggest takeaway? Please put it in the comment section below. Was it number one? Was it number two? Number three? You know what my favorite one was? Number five, don't get bored doing the fundamentals. That being said, make sure you subscribe, hit like, and I appreciate you tuning into the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. To meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you. Bye-bye.